Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to our June 10th meeting. Thank you for coming, appreciate it. I'll remind people that the meeting is being recorded and live streamed. Um, as usual, you can contact me, James Glazier, Reinhard Labenbacher, uh, Jim Sluka, who's gonna be on holiday next week, Bruce Shapiro, who's on holiday this week, uh, if you have any questions or issues that you want to raise. Uh, people know by now our Slack channel, Twitter channel, iMag page, uh, LinkedIn page, and the YouTube channel. Uh, I encourage people to help us with those and use them. Uh, are there any quick announcements that people need to make before we get started? I'll make, uh, I'll make one. I just put in the chat box, uh, there's a postdoc opening in my lab. Uh, I'm just putting together the details on it, but it entails uh, combining mechanistic and data-driven or AI ML, computational modeling, molecular and cellular level, including uh, virus infections and infection spread, and physiological level, including uh, uh, neuromuscular uh, physiological control of organs. Uh, so if you're interested, or if you know people, please uh, um, forward them the information and I can provide details. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Anybody else? Okay, we're going to have a steering group meeting tomorrow morning. People who need to be there know who you are. Uh, we will have a different uh, Zoom link for tomorrow only. Uh, that should have been sent around in an email. If anybody needs that uh, steering committee link, please contact me or Reinhardt. Uh, next week, uh, we have one speaker lined up, Chantal. Uh, June 24th, we have Lisbeth uh, Garris and Rufus Pollock uh, speaking to us. If anybody is interested in, in speaking on the 17th or the last minute, let us know. But I think we could also very favorably use that time for a broader discussion about the purpose of the working group. So I hope uh, we can take advantage of that. And I'm sure Chantal would also like to have uh, a little more time if possible. So uh, without any more ado, I'm going to go move on to uh, the first talk. Uh, since we haven't been able to get Adi on, we're going to go to Charles Taylor. Uh, both of our speakers today have a hard stop at four o'clock, so we will not have our usual uh, post-meeting discussion. Therefore, we'll have a brief uh, question session after the presentations. If I can ask people to please mute uh, their uh, mics, that would be great. And I'll turn the meeting over to Charles. Thank you. Let me share my slides. Um... Here we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. All right, well, I'll get started. So, um, yeah, the topic uh, was an interesting topic, um, you know, to trust computational modeling. What I, what I want to tell you a little bit about is the work that we're doing, um, doing at Heartflow. And this is really is a continuation of the work that I started when I was on faculty at Stanford. Um, I uh, joined the faculty actually in, after finishing my doctorate at Stanford. Um, joined the faculty, actually first in surgery department, and then had a joint appointment in, in um, mechanical engineering and surgery. I was the, one of the founding faculty of the bioengineering department, helped set up the biomedical computing program at Stanford as well. Um, and after 14 years on the faculty and developing uh, technology, I really uh, felt that I wanted to this in the next chapter of my life to be able to get it out and to have it used in patients. Um, and actually, it really, you know, started me on this journey of starting, uh, of not only developing tools, but um, actually integrating them into clinical care. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. I just recently ended my affiliation with Stanford um, after about, you know, eight or nine years afterwards as an adjunct faculty, but I still have appointments in, in University of Texas and Technical University of Eindhoven uh, as well. So, um, I tell my students this, or I mean, uh, I would say, I'm sorry, my employees this all the time. I constantly remind them uh, about trust and about this Dutch proverb, arise on foot, but leaves on horseback. And obviously this is critically important in what we do, uh, developing computational methods, providing evidence, quality results, 
um, you know, uh, to all the patients that are the customers or physicians serve is really key. Um, but it is indeed something that um, uh, can be lost if, if care is not taken to retain it. Um, a bit about the origin of the technology. I started off um, actually before going to Stanford for my doctorate. I done a degree in, um, in a bachelor's in uh, mechanical engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic, uh, started working at G Research Labs in, um, in the um, late 1980s, developing computational methods for a variety of different problems in, in solid mechanics, aircraft engine design, uh, manufacturing, et cetera. And then um, did a master's degree in uh, mechanical engineering, a master's degree in mathematics at uh, Rensselaer, and then uh, wanted to go off to my to get my doctorate and in, in, uh, chose uh, Stanford, which was a wonderful place to be, um, and uh, still still is. Uh, but I had the the great uh, privilege of working um, with Tom Hughes as my primary thesis advisor and Chris Aaron's a surgeon. Um, as my co-advisor. And we really, as a grad student, started to develop some of the foundations to combine medical imaging together with computational fluid dynamics techniques to understand blood flow through arteries. And this is the very first patient-specific model um, in a, just the flow characteristics, recirculating flow in a uh, aneurysm of a, of a, a patient. Um, and it is another example of flow into the from the arch of the aorta all the way into the brain and the circle of Willis in a patient that has this inter, uh, inter um, uh, uh, cranial uh, saccular aneurysm. Um, this is again, the first case in 95, we started to think and, you know, again, working as an engineer and, and developing computational methods, you know, I, I was of course, uh, well aware of the power of simulation and modeling to, and design. Um, and as I went into medicine, it was uh, obviously a very different discipline, and, but thought that some of these techniques uh, for design could actually be applied to designing surgeries um, in the cardiovascular system. And this is uh, some software we developed in 1998 and a paper that I had published on this idea of predicting outcomes of interventions for surgery. Um, and we started to really lay the foundations at Stanford and build some of the core technology the, the extracting geometry from image data, a more realistic closed loop physiology systems, uh, solver technology and fluid structure interactions. And, um, and did uh, some of the papers I'm really proud of are this paper in um, this, what's called the coupled multi-domain method about how to, it was really um, a, um, I was inspired by uh, Joe Keller's work in Dirichlet to Neumann, uh, maps and boundary conditions. Uh, and uh, Joe was very influential in, in you know, my thinking uh, in, this, in this way. Um, and a paper that we wrote on how to basically solve for that problem where you're interested in flow in part of the arterial tree, but it's a closed loop system and you have to be cognizant of how to couple the rest of the circulatory system. And this is a technique that you know, we, we've used in you know, uh, in, in, has been described now in, in hundreds of uh, other papers, subsequent papers, um, as you know, one of the kind of better techniques for coupling and uh, solving away propagation problem through the circulatory system with uh, information from upstream and downstream. We also developed a method for uh, fluid dynamic for uh, coupling um, flow and uh, vessel dynamics. Um, and it, this was actually inspired by a technique, uh, mathematician, Jared Wormersley um, uh, did some work in the 1950s to look at flow through elastic uh, vessels, elastic blood vessels, a really kind of brilliant work ahead of its time. Um, we developed a computational method inspired by that to be able to do things like, and this, this is, uh, you know, kind of culmination of this work, looking at flow and pressure wave propagation through the entire circulation um, and, and the ability to be able to map realistic pressure and flow waves um, uh, in, uh, in a you know, large scale fluid structure uh, problem. So this has kind of came together, um, uh, some of the work that was done in my lab. Um, is the students that uh, of course I would uh, wanna recognize the uh, doctoral students and postdocs uh, from my lab. And of course, the funding uh, work that went into this. And this, again, was the foundation, foundational work um, for ultimately what I took out of the university. Um, I actually had a grant from the National Institutes of Health, one of the national centers for biomedical computing that uh, 
that as a result of this, I open sourced this software. It's now uh, available, a, a open source software called SimVascular. Um, and it's, it's pretty broadly used now in a variety of different uh, problems um, in, uh, in academics. Question for me is how do we actually bring this into clinical practice? And this is just, a, this is actually one of our patients and um, a firefighter that was experiencing exertional chest pain um, and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Uh, ultimately, um, I had a variety of different uh, tests, but he just felt, felt lousy, you know, when he was doing his job and uh, ended up getting a cardiac CT scan and, and a heart flow analysis. And this, this picture, Basically, uh, the, it's color coded where red is quote bad, meaning this value, this numerical value, um, if it was 1.0, it would be close to normal, but it's a ratio of the downstream pressure to the upstream pressure uh, in the coronary arteries. Um, and uh, it, when it's below 0 0.8, it's below the clinical threshold that indicates that patients benefit from a treatment, a stenting or a, a surgical procedure uh, to improve uh, flow to the muscle of the heart. So this is kind of the foundations of it. What underlies it is, um, is the problem that we're working on, which is the leading, uh, leading cause of death. Even in the COVID uh, period in 2020, heart disease, deaths due to heart disease greatly exceeded those due to, uh, to the coronavirus. Of course, it was, they were intertwined um, in, in different ways. One is, the, is COVID actually led to uh, uh, myocarditis in some patients. But the other, the other perhaps unexpected consequence is, especially in the early days of the pandemic, many patients were too afraid to go into hospitals and were basically, to be blunt, uh, staying at home and having heart attacks. Uh, symptoms that they would have had that would have ordinarily led them to go in and see a cardiologist. Um, uh, unfortunately, there was a large number in, in, in all parts of the world that experienced the, the uh, pandemic. Uh, where there was, uh, they were presenting too late sometimes, presenting instead of with chest, instead of presenting with chest pain, presenting after they had a myocardial infarction. So it was a sharp spike in death uh, due to uh, the heart disease, and especially in, in uh, May and uh, June of uh, last year. So this is starting to come under control, but again, it's a massive clinical problem. The root cause of most heart disease and most uh, heart attacks um, is atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries. And as this atherosclerosis develops, um, the, uh, it can become obstructive. It can reduce the blood supply to the muscle of the heart. But the bigger issue is when the plaque becomes unstable. And the plaque, for a variety of reasons, the composition of the plaque, uh, the forces acting on the plaque uh, when it ruptures, and then a clot forms, and the patient can have a, have a myocardial infarction. And if it's in a large territory, a large vessel, supplying a large portion of the muscle of the heart, uh, then these patients can, um, again, have a heart attack or die. Um, and for many patients, the very first symptom that they experience is actually, unfortunately, death or fatal heart attack um, is the first sign of heart disease. So what is the challenge? Um, you have a group of patients that have suspected coronary disease, and you want to figure out which ones can just be um, which ones don't have any coronary disease, which ones can go home, even though there's suspicion of coronary disease, what percentage can be treated with medicine, for instance, to lower their cholesterol, um, to lower uh, their, their blood pressure, for example, or, or maybe lifestyle modifications. Um, but there are some patients who need a further invasive assessment or maybe even need surgery. Um, so this is the dilemma when a patient presents in the emergency department, when a patient walks in with chest pain, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's actually relatively unlikely that they have significant coronary artery disease. Most often it's something else. Um, but if it is significant coronary disease, you need to find that because these are the patients that might present with chest pain and, and die of a myocardial infarction if they're not treated properly. The fundamental problem that we're trying to tackle is that of the non-invasive tests that are used to understand and evaluate patients who are symptomatic, uh, echo, stress echo looks at wall motion abnormalities in the, in the ventricle. Uh, nuclear testing uh, looks at perfusion deficits in an EKG and a treadmill, for instance, looks for obviously abnormalities in the electrical wave propagation um, uh, in the uh, myocardium, in the atrium myocardium. The fundamental problem is none of these directly visualize the coronary arteries, which is where the disease occurs. And what's quite striking 
um, is the result of that is that more than 50% of patients that have an invasive angiogram, they were sent there because of a non-invasive functional test, have no coronary disease, no obstructive coronary disease. And this is quite remarkable. And um, this has been evaluated in, you know, studies with, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients. Also, sometimes when the tests are negative, they falsely reassure the patient that they don't have significant disease. And, um, and I, I know many, many patients who have then had, a, have had an event, for instance, a myocardial infarction after a negative, uh, new, negative uh, uh, stress test. So the better way to do it and the more precise way of understanding whether a patient has coronary disease and whether it's functionally significant is to do an invasive angiogram uh, to inject uh, dye into the coronary arteries and then measure pressure with a pressure wire. That's the gold standard. Uh, the issue is that these require invasive cardiac catheterization and about 40% of patients that enter the cath lab for this invasive angiogram, only 40% for, only have obstructive disease, have areas of narrowing. Another 40% of the patients where you see anatomic narrowing, only 40% of them have a positive functional test. So for 100 patients that we bring into the cardiac catheterization lab to evaluate them for symptoms of chest pain, only about 16% of those would be those patients that you would evaluate would be positive and then you would intervene on them. Um, so this is pretty remarkable that it's a very low utility. Um, there's low clinical utility of, of this, uh, this pathway. Um, so the fundamental question is, could we identify this before the cardiac cath? And this metric, again, being a ratio of pressures and, and you know, in, in my work in simulating blood flow and pressure and trying to do this at a very realistic uh, conditions, this led us to, to think that we might be able to actually do this entirely non-invasively. So the, the foundation for it is a cardiac CT where you have exquisite 3D anatomic data. It's not as high of a spatial or temporal resolution as angiography, but it makes up for it. Um, and then it's uh, the technique that we've developed this fractional flow reserve derived from CT. And this is every case that we do, every patient uh, that is analyzed, we provide these results back to the physician. They can interact with it in their interface. This ratio, again, if it's below 0.8, um, then it indicates that there's a lesion that could warrant uh, stenting if it's above that. Uh, then the evidence shows that, that patients can be safely treated with medicine. Um, so how do we do this? Um, it, it really is, again, image-based modeling. The first part is deriving, is extracting you know, the domain that we're ultimately, we're gonna solve partial differential equations for, for blood flow. Um, and of course, it's defining the computational domain, uh, the domain of interest, extracting that from the CT data. Uh, a, a virtual or uh, computational physiology model that basically is defining boundary conditions, and then uh, the computational fluid dynamics assessment uh, for flow and pressure uh, calculation. The challenge, one of the first challenges you run into, you encounter, is that the image data can be of you know great, you know highly variable. Some patients, these are patients cases that we would have all accepted CT data we would accept for processing. But you can see the, the boundaries, it can be fuzzy, can be noisy. There's calcium here in this spot. There's a patient more calcium in the coronary arteries. This dark area might be a blooming, might be a, um, a um, artifact uh, resulting from the calcium, essentially shadow uh, resulting from the, from the calcium. And the challenge is we have to resolve the geometry to a resolution that actually uh, exceeds the spatial resolution of, um, of the underlying imaging. So it's important for a variety of reasons to, to resolve and get a very accurate boundary. So um, one of our customers tells us, you know, the, we had this quote that I really like. He says, you find things I miss, but you cannot miss things I find. This is this point about trust and becoming a trusted partner for a physician means that you have to, you have to set a very high bar. And we have a much higher bar set upon us by our physicians, in part because when you say you're going to use AI, you're going to use computers, they, they have an expectation that, of course, it's going to be a lot better than another test that's more human centered. Um, so it's a high bar. How do we do this? Um, the an anatomic extraction is um, we use uh, deep learning methods for our geometry extraction. We've had them in our cleared product for more than four years. Uh, we've really tried to develop a company, even though we're regulated by the FDA, that we could have rapid product releases. Um, and this is a lot of, you know, uh, work and negotiation work with the FDA. 
um, and, and um, you know, really also building, it's not just building trust with physicians, but it's building trust with your regulatory agency. We've actually done 75 product releases in the last 10 years. So we're not, you know, releasing like Google does every day, and, and that will not happen in a regulated environment, but um, we're, we're able to do this relatively quickly. So it's AI, and it's a human in the loop. So the analysts annotate the model, they inspect and correct the results of our anatomic model in the context of image data, and then we can learn it. It's not a continuous learning, but but the um, we can you know uh, process a number of cases, then retrain the model, and then the net result of that is that our analysts typically have to do less and less work. So you gradually, as the algorithm gets better, then you the analysts are really into a kind of inspection uh, role, not a, a correction role. Um, everything else is automated and we provide these results back to the customers. So the, again, the deep learning methods, it's large structures, it's center line uh, tracing and, and, um, and then also the, the inner boundary. Um, there are, you know, our business model really facilitates this, uh, the ability to do this because we have now, we have probably about 150,000 unique analyses that have been performed um, on, date, on this data on different CT uh, data sets. So uh, we're able to really uh, get the algorithms to be you know, significantly better. And th these are all proprietary uh, algorithms. Um, you know, we, we have actually a, a lab um, uh, collaboration with the Imperial College uh, in London in their uh, AI and uh, uh, machine learning group uh, in healthcare. Um, and we have some research scientists there, but we continue to develop and refine these methods. Then it's the human in the loop, and it really is having people, specialists that are trained to really do one thing, to look at the computer model in the context of the image data and, and inspect and correct. Our, our diagnostic accuracy is very high compared to other tests, but our actually our real world, you know, false negative and false positive complaint rate is very low. Um, we have a complaint rate of false negatives that's about 0.3% um, and false positives about 0.5%. Of course, this is undoubtedly underreported, but it really is the quality, you know, of the product that the physicians count on. They count on, you know, getting a result back from them that if they take the patient to the cath lab, it will look the same. Um, and that's a big part of it. And also, um, not just a high quality product, but clinical data now in over 400 uh, publications. This is an example of the type of uh, evaluation work that we do, validation. In this case, it was a patient that had a CT. We extracted the boundary of the vessel, and then we compared it to intravascular imaging, uh, optical coherence tomography, and, and wrote a paper about it and published, uh, published those uh, clinical results uh, comparing. And we actually demonstrated that we could validate the accuracy of the lumen um, at about a 0.2 millimeter uh, accuracy. Um, we have to solve the fluid dynamics equations of blood flow, of course, um, and, um, and to get uh, velocity and pressure. Um, we understand these uh, physical laws, and uh, it's, I will tell you it's sometimes a challenge to explain the Navier-Stokes equations to, uh, to physicians with um, sometimes little mathematics uh, background. Um, uh, and I think we're probably getting better at it. In the end of the day, they just want to know that it works. They're sometimes less concerned about how it works. Um, boundary conditions are a major issue here, obviously, in resolving the boundary conditions. Um, we use this uh, coupled uh, multi-domain method I described and um, have a physiologic model, again, a paper I published um, in the cardiology literature, um, really using form function information, using information that we could extract from the CT about the size of the heart, the pattern, the branching patterns of the blood vessels, and then a, a physiology model um, that uh, accounts for how uh, intravenous adenosine vasodilates the coronary arteries. Um, and we've done what I will tell you we've learned, and there's a few papers we wrote on uncertainty quantification. By far the most important issue is resolution of the anatomy. In the, especially in the areas of stenosis. The physiology model is, uh, is less, um, it, it is important, but it, uh, the, the variability due to the range of parameters of the physiology model is, is lower uh, than uh, the anatomic accuracy. And we've also looked at things like fluid properties uh, as well. Where I hope to go ultimately is to provide a clinical report where we provide confidence intervals, uh, not just uh, the uh, net results. 
um, and we provide this back through all the different frame, you know, platforms for physicians. They interact with it on their iPhones, they bring in the cath lab, it's in their electronic health records as well. Um, I apologize, I have, my son is here, I've got to just tell him to get to the front door, one second. Sorry for that Zoom interruption. <laughs> um, so uh, again, another point about trust, but trust but verify. So in the end of the day, what matters to our physicians is we provide the data and the evidence. You know, this is a study, head-to-head, -head you know, a study on performance, sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy against other tests. It's really thought the gold standard is positron emission uh, tomography. Um, and this is actually water pet. It's not available in the US. Um, that was the gold standard, but we beat the diagnostic performance of, of every other uh, test. Um, and a lot of hospitals use it in the US um, and a lot of patients so far have benefited from it. Um, our data shows that if you have a heart flow study, if it's negative, then it's safe to defer invasive procedures. It's, it's very accurate uh, and the stenting procedures can be deferred uh, safely. Patients do better if they're treated with medicine with a negative uh, heart flow test and they do better if they're stented, if the test is positive. Um, and the other uh, uh, important thing is that if you take a lot of patients and save them a trip to an invasive procedure, it's, it's very cost savings. So in the US healthcare system, it amounts to savings of about $3,000 per patient um, using Medicare adjusted uh, costs. And as a result, it's, the test is paid for by Medicare and all private insurance companies. This is our most recent data, again, on evidence, and this is 10-year um, data now. So this is at 10 years out, and having a, a an, if, um, medical, if stenting is deferred, um, then, it, then the event rate, if you defer it with a low value of, the, of FFRCT, then you have a high event rate. But if it's, um, if it's a high value of FFRCT, you have a low event rate. Whereas stenting um, is, uh, is better than uh, medical therapy for low values, but it's worse than medical therapy for high values. And we can look at uh, survival curves, Kaplan-Meier survival curves, and really can prove that uh, the test can, is useful. It's not just accurate against invasive measurements, but it's clinically useful to make a decision about whether to treat or defer, um, um, whether to treat uh, with a stent or uh, defer and treat with medical therapy. Last thing I'll, I'll tell you about is a new tool, and it's always been our ambition to actually use this modeling and simulation tool and something you can not do in a, uh, in, a, um, in a catheterization lab, but actually virtually remove areas of disease and virtually treat a patient. So we actually just uh, completed a study um, where we looked at our predictions uh, versus invasive measurements pre and post stenting um, and uh, the end result, this is a, a Bland Altman plot, is that we had a mean difference of just a 0.02 FFR units um, and then a standard deviation of 0.07. And we were able to accurately predict the functional gain of uh, stenting. So this is the first step into actually using this in a treatment planning mode, uh, using simulations to design um, procedures for patients uh, with heart disease. Um, so I'll kind of uh, I'll close uh, here. And again, the, um, the development of the, there's a lot of mathematics behind this. It's mathematical model blood flow for precision diagnostics and therapy optimization. Um, if we want to get physicians to trust you, it's provide a high quality test and to really, I would say, lean into the science and, um, and uh, you know, publish uh, and uh, support uh, clinical research um, and, uh, and other, uh, other research that can bring the field forward. Um, so I'm, I will, the, uh, I always describe it as kind of a 25 year journey getting to where we are, but it, it didn't really look like this. And it was, there's a lot of difficult things along the way uh, and problems that had to be solved and how we, we really, you know, uh, made it to where we're at is really with, these are all clinical trials and studies. Uh, and there's, you know, dozens more um, that we've done to be able to provide evidence that the technology works and that uh, they can trust it. So I will uh, stop there. And um, I don't know if we have a couple of minutes for questions, I'd be happy to take those. Thank you very much. Is Adi here somehow under another 
uh, login. Pseud pseudonym. No. Well, in that case, you have the remaining half hour to <laughs> chat. So please, I'll open the floor to questions. A fascinating talk. Wonderful to see a success story of the use of multi-scale modeling to do something that gets into the clinic. So I thought of cardiovascular as one of the areas that's most advanced in this. And so I hope there'll be lots of questions. So the floor is open for discussion. I have a question. This is Reinhard. Uh, this was a fascinating talk, uh, incredible tools uh, that you've developed, Charles. I have a question. I have a um, cardiologist colleague here who is interested in um, diseases of the microvasculature, yeah. uh, the sort of techniques you have uh, and, and the imaging. Apparently, there are some issues with it. Can you elaborate yeah. a bit? Yeah, it's a great question. So what we, and by the way, this technique that we're trying to, you know, this invasive technique where you put a pressure wire in the coronary arteries and you measure the downstream pressure divided by the root, root aortic pressure, it's done under conditions of maximum flow. So that typically in the catheterization lab, they inject a drug adenosine to vasodilate the microcirculation and to get maximal flow. Um, and that's, that's the invasive, that's the invasive technique. So we simulate that but we have to make assumptions about the microvasculature in order to basically define the boundary conditions. And the question is, are the assumptions that we make under what circumstances are they valid? Um, in, in what circumstances might they be uh, questionable? And um, what I will tell you is that the benefit of this clinical technique, this fractional flow reserve technique, what it, it doesn't tell you completely whether blood flow is compromised to the muscle of the heart. Because if you had a microvascular disease, you could have a lack of flow, but you don't have any pressure gradient in the epicardial, uh, in the large coronary arteries that are feeding the microcirculation. And then you'd get a negative test, but the patient really has, you know, a lack of coronary blood flow. So the fundamental invasive test that we are comparing against has a limitation with evaluating microvascular disease. So we quote, inherit that limitation. So we can't answer all questions about coronary disease if a, and explain all situations where a patient is symptomatic. Um, but what we can tell the doc, the, physio, the cardiologist is if our test is negative, don't bother with a stent. You know, you won't benefit the patient. If it's positive, then, um, then likely the patient has a pressure gradient in the epicardial compartment that could benefit from stenting. So it's it's in. Um, so I think that's the that's kind of the short answer. The long answer is I believe there's a lot of, and I would say most cardiologists would agree. I don't think it's likely that you would have microvascular disease without any signature of that in the large feeding vessels, because the large feeding vessels, if you have microvascular disease, will respond to a lack of flow or a high resistance and likely will adapt. So that's what I believe. Um, and we have seen it applied to patients with microvascular disease and there's, there's no obvious degradation of performance. Um, but you know, there's, there's certainly some things to learn there. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, a, a practical question. Yep. As a as a non medical person, if I if I go to the cardiologist and he says we need to do a something, what is it I tell him I want to have done first? <laughs> well, this is <laughs> a great question. And, What's and the I words will... I use? And he'll go <laughs> a what? But <laughs> well, let me let me. I, I'm not a physician, so I will not give you medical advice here. But I will tell you what I will tell what I've told my wife, my loved ones about this. The truth of the matter is, and you know, the tests that are commonly used, it is quite surprising um, what the performance of those tests is. And um, you know, as I said, you know, the doctors themselves, you know, I, I, I won't tell you the hospital name, but I was at a hospital in this large academic medical center in the United States, where they call stress echo as a test, a coin flip test. That's what the cardiologists call it, but they do it a thousand times a month. So why would you think that that would happen? Or in, in oftentimes people talk about nuclear medicine and they say you should switch the order of the N and the U. It's in fact unclear medicine. That's what they openly say, but they do it millions of times a year in the United States. And the quite, you're not gonna like the reason, um, but, it's, uh, but it's, we have a fee-for-service healthcare system. 
And uh, these tests are, are often um, performed because they are well reimbursed. Um, and we have a culture where if you have symptoms of coronary disease, you've got to get a test. So, um, so that's the, that's the kind of the truth and the reality. And, and, um, you know, by the way, I will also tell you about the nuclear imaging in, in the evaluation of a group called, um, um, SMEDPAC, um, advises Congress on the most wasteful Medicare reimbursed procedures on that list is nuclear stress testing as one of the most wasteful procedures, wasting billions of dollars, but it's reimbursed by Medicare. Well, um, so that's, this is a whole different, you know, conversation. So to the short answer though, is that you want to see your coronary arteries. In the end of the day, if you have symptoms of heart disease, you want to have a test where you can actually see your coronary arteries and don't let them take you immediately to a cardiac catheterization lab because you can do a non-invasive test. You can get a cardiac CT scan. That is the starting point. You know, I've had, I had one 10 years ago. I had one more recently and I didn't have coronary disease and it is so, you know, liberating, you know, you know or empowering to know that, that that is the case. I've had loved ones that have been in the same exact situation. Sometimes you see disease. Uh, by the way, the bad news is everybody over a certain age will get some atherosclerosis. It's just a question of whether, of whether um, it, it, you know, it leads to a premature death or to uh, a disablement. Um, so uh, that's the, that's the challenge. Uh, but I would absolutely insist on getting, uh, uh, being able to see your coronary arteries and to get a non-invasive test, start with a CT. Uh, when they, when the CT is normal, then the patient, you know, they know what to do. And they, they, the data shows that if you have a normal, completely normal coronary CT, you do not have risk of dying of a heart attack for almost 10 years uh, because of the progression of the disease. But if the test is positive and you see atherosclerosis, then the question of what happens next, that's where we come in, um, the what happens next. Uh, but as I said, we're paid for by all, almost all private insurance companies in the United States uh, all, by Medicare, reimbursed by Medicare. So, you know, our test is, is very accessible, at least in the U.S., but, but hopefully you don't need it. <laughs> but what is it called? What do I say? Heart flow. Would... It's just heart flow, the heart flow test. But you, would ask, for a, you would ask for a cardiac CT um, and uh, that you want to see your coronary arteries, you would start with a cardiac CT. And then, uh, then if they find disease, then that's when uh, you'd ask, ask for a test. Thank you. You, you, okay. mentioned, you mentioned that, that I mean, a lot of people are diagnosed by dying. Yeah. And anne aneurysms are even worse that way. Yeah, that's right. Um, and you showed some aneurysm results. Could you talk? Yeah. Talk a little bit more about aneurysm diagnosis because there yeah, you have to just add the biomechanics of the right. uh, of the, the the vessel wall as well. That's right. No, that's it. So, and I, I wrote a review paper with Jay Jay Humphrey, who's at Yale, um, on this uh, topic. It was I don't remember which uh, one of the annual reviews. I think in in biomedical engineering, perhaps some years ago on this topic and in intracranial and also abdominal aortic aneurysms. Um, and uh, from a diagnosis perspective, uh, it is indeed a challenge that, you know, you, if you, um, sometimes imaging studies are done, but patients might not present with a symptom of an aneurysm. So that's this, that's the scary part. Um, you know, um, and with, with uh, cerebrovascular aneurysms, it can happen at a younger age. Um, and, um, you know, affects women more often than men. Um, and abdominal aortic aneurysms and thoracic aneurysms typically happen later in life. Unfortunately, there's no like pre predisposing genetic factor, unless a patient has Marfan syndrome, then, then those patients will get surveilled uh, for that. Uh, but most patients, you, you don't know some, you know, there's no test that you can do. So so uh, that, that is a case uh, where we, there's no screening. Screening is not uh, approved for that. You might make a case for it. We, we believe screening for coronary artery disease is more than justified, you know, with a leading cause of death. And if you detect it early, then you can manage the patient effectively medically more often than not. Um, but that is, um, we're not there yet, you know, from a healthcare system. Uh, we're not there yet. I, I believe if we could reduce some of the waste in our healthcare system, we could actually do a much better job of managing uh, heart disease as well as aneurysms. But 
Um, the, there, there is a lot of work going on in aneurysms in trying to understand the mechanics of aneurysms. If you see one, the question is, is it going to progress or do you treat it, you know, immediately prophylactically? So the diagnostic for that again would be uh, CT, head, a, head, a head MRI, or uh, yeah, or a head, or a head CT. Vascular, you have to do, you have to do a vascular imaging. Yes, you do. Uh, yeah, you do. So yeah. Uh, yeah. is there, was there somebody else have their hand up? Because I had a second question, but go ahead, Lorenzo. Hi, Charles. Thank you very much for the talk. It was amazing. Uh, I have two that are kind of correlated. The one is uh, if you are yet with uh, the kind of data you can extract from the CT at a level where you can simulate the local flow. So to estimate stuff like, I don't know, wall shear stress, uh, yeah. this kind of thing. Yeah. And the correlated one is that you have perhaps any data or any suggestion that uh, the kind of innate geometry of each person, yes. vascular tree is somehow correlated to disease progression or the probability of getting arteriosclerosis because people say that turbulent yeah. flow and things like that are those that at the end cause the endothelial damage and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, so I, what I would say, uh, first of all, you know, taking the, the latter, actually for both of those, um, yes, we, we're doing 3D flow calculations um, and we actually use a hybrid method where we'll do reduced order models in areas where we know the physics is a little bit, you know, simpler. Um, and then in areas where there's more 3D complexity, we'll solve the 3D, you know, fluid dynamics equations, we can resolve shear stress. Um, we have an effort, a, pro a different study that I, I didn't describe where we've um, taken a group of patients that have had heart attacks and have presented at the time of, of the heart attack within, they've used invasive procedures to determine exactly where the plaque ruptured. In the coronary arteries. And then, then the physicians went back to the medical records and they said, did the patient happen to have a cardiac CT scan in some time period before, before they were symptomatic and presented? Um, and we analyzed that data. And what we showed is that the very best predictor of uh, plaque rupture um, and thrombus, you know, a, a plaque rupture is what leads to thrombus formation and a heart attack was the difference in pressure across the lesion, which was quite interesting. Shear stress was also as predictive um, in high shear stress in the throat of the stenosis, but that's just correlated with pressure gradient. And then the plaque characteristics are important. So what we're doing now, and we actually have a grant together with the University of Texas uh, funded by the National Science Foundation is to put all these pieces together into a biomechanical model of, uh, cor of coronary atherosclerosis to be able to see whether we can do a better job of predicting risk. If you can do that, then you can manage patients differently. There are, for instance, very, they're very aggressive lipid lowering drugs, new drugs that are out and available. They're very expensive and we couldn't put everybody, you know, you might not know this, but about 25 million people in this country are on statins. Um, if you, the pharmaceutical industry had their way, it would be 50 million. Um, and, uh, and we cannot, but that, those are cheap. Those drugs are cheap. But if you look at a new drug, like a PCSK9 inhibitor, which is very good and very aggressive, but it's $10,000 a year. You cannot put 50 million patients on a lipid, aggressive lipid lowering or even 5 million patients probably on it. So the question is, how do you find an enriched population where they are most likely to have heart attacks if you don't treat them more aggressively uh, and then do that? So I, I think this technology is really helpful uh, and that's what we'll, we'll prove. You know, ultimately, you know, in, in probably within the next couple of years, we'll start a very large clinical trial uh, to look at uh, asymptomatic individuals and to see if we can identify groups that have the highest risk. And if we can, by identifying them, we can reduce uh, the rate of heart attack. And, you know, our goal is it's uh, ambitious, but it's simple. It's to basically reduce premature death uh, due to uh, coronary heart disease. Um, and I do believe it's attainable. Thank you. I think uh, Mitchell had his hand up first, uh, John. Yep. Hey, Charles. Thank you so much for giving this talk. It was great. Um, I, and you kind of talked about this a minute ago, but in regards to reduced order models and surrogate models, I, you know, I, these, mo these computational fluid dynamic models are great. They provide such great detail. Yeah. But if you want a clinical tool, you really need something like you've shown that works on an iPad or is going to be yeah. done. Yeah. 
you know, pretty quickly. So what's the balance there, especially with integrating the, the imaging data from the patients? I mean, yeah. what's the balance between high fidelity predictions that you know you can, you can trust with the accuracy versus developing these surrogates that could be integrated into the clinic? Well, these that we're using, you know, 3D computational fluid dynamics in there, but it's in a hybrid model. So we, in our computation time is about 10 minutes, you know, on a, um, you know, on in Amazon uh, cloud. So it's not expensive. It's, and it's plenty fast enough, even for patients in the emergency department. Um, but if you want to do things real time, like we, we, we want to physicians interact with the model real time, you have to reduce, reduce our models. But I think, you know, if you're, if you're clever, then you can figure out how to develop these, train them with the 3D models uh, and to get them so they're very fast and, um, and you know, for their intended uh, purpose. But if you want more complex information, Sometimes you have to pay the, you know, pay the price, but I, I'm, I'm really interested. I've been following, you know, some George Karnadakis' work and, and more of the kind of, you know, uh, these hybrid between deep learning, you know, models, I guess, uh, and, um, and uh, never Stokes equation. So I'm really interested in that. Uh, and we're starting to kind of look at some of those uh, in some of those areas, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely a problem for the future, but, but I think one has to be, have the right, you know, you have to, it depends upon the question you're trying to answer. You know, can you, can you have a fast reduced order model, a little lower fidelity? Um, and can you answer the question sufficiently and, and uh, you can tackle it that way. Great. Right, thank John? you. Yeah. Uh, John, another question. So your software, what, what part of the FDA yeah. does your regulatory assessment yeah. You, are, are you falling under this new rubric of software as a medical device? Yeah, we are. Yeah. And we're, we're, we've been kind of the poster child for it, uh, actually, John, because um, we were the first, you know, uh, software as a medical device to go through the, the pathway. We go through the circulatory system devices panel, which is a pretty high bar. So it's the panel that, you know, evaluates the you know, heart valves and stents and things like that. So we're regulated at a, it's a high bar. Um, and we had to provide a lot of data really focused on accuracy that we could, you know, compare favorably to the accuracy of the invasive pressure, to the invasive pressure measurements. Um, but we, yeah, there are, and this has been a kind of a constant dialogue over the years um, because what we, you know, what we believe is that of course, and this is also this point about trust is that, you know, we want to be able to continue to improve our product, behave like a software company, be able to, you know, refine the product without having to submit a new 510K, which could take, you know, three to six months. Um, we do that, but we do that, you know, intermittently. And most of the time we do go through a process called letter to file, where if we have the internal evidence um, and we've pre-negotiated the changes that we could make to our software, um, and uh, then, and we can prove that we are doing things that uh, don't degrade performance, then we have some flexibility. That's, you know, we, we were going to a two to four week release cycle um, and you have to balance like the regulatory burden, the paperwork, you know, documentation burden versus how fast you want to be able to bring, you know, and update your, update your software. But it's, it's been, um, I would say a learning experience on both sides. So this is, a, a question that's coming up more and more. It's like um, there's a there's an expectation. There's guidelines that the FDA now has yeah. for what you need to provide for them to assess the credibility of your yes. model. Yes. So so the issue of model accreditation, which yes. is not in your hands, it's right. in theirs. Yes. Do you have any idea? Can you comment on? How much more is it costing you to do the documentation that you now have to do versus how much you save by doing the documentation that the FDA wants <laughs> when it comes yeah. to tests? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think with my, you know, we were, again, kind of ahead of the curve on this um, yeah, so I, I, I would like to say, and I, I believe it's the case, that we have as high of a quality bar, maybe a little higher than, than they do, because for us, it's, again, the trust, you know, 
Um, so I don't feel that there's more burden uh, that is placed on us as a result of the FDA because it's, it's just kind of inherent in what we do. Um, it, you know, I, it's a bigger deal. You, one of the things I didn't mention is that if we have a patient that is misdiagnosed from our test and has a clinical event, a heart attack, for instance, if we miss somebody, um, then we have to report that to the FDA. It's a, you know, it's a reportable event. We've only had to do that four times out of the last 85,000 patients. So I'm very, you know, but that there has been a tremendous amount of work that has gone into driving quality into the system uh, to make that happen. But um, that's, you know, as I said, it's, that's the you trust. That's why the physicians, you know, when we, we, they, when they get our result, they, they don't always trust us at first. They're very skeptical sometimes. Like, what is this, you know, um, that you're giving me and how could it possibly as, be as good as an actual machine or measurement device? It's, it's, it's a computer model, right? Um, and that's a, that's a challenge, you know, to get across that. But once you do it, um, then I, I think you can, um, then they, you know, then they kind of, you know, start to use, uh, use your product, but you have to make sure you always perform. You can't, can't screw up sometime. And, you know, uh, because of that, that could be somebody's, you know, somebody's life. Um, so that's the, that's the bar. But I, I do feel that um, there's a lot of opportunities, you know, like like ours uh, in healthcare. There are a lot of opportunities to bring these technologies uh, into uh, into medical care, and um, hopefully, we'll get you know a lot of doctors thinking like uh, mathematicians and, and engineers, uh, which I think would be a which would be probably a pretty good thing. Thank you. That was I, okay, I had the okay. honor of participating a whole lot in the MDIC when they yeah. were. Yeah, developing that whole thing and working with NASA. And it's just really nice to talk to somebody who's benefited from it. Yeah. And and um, not have such a resistance to the idea that you have to do that kind of quality work. Yeah. yeah. If you want them to accept models because they can't pick it up in their hand and feel it. Yeah. That, and mm -hmm. that is, is a concern that I have is that obviously is as this goes forward, I feel, you know, we feel a responsibility, you know, for that to not, not screw it up. Like don't screw it up. Um, because I do recognize that this is, um, you know, we're setting precedent, you know, with respect to the FDA and the agency, but I, I think we've, you know, built a, a very strong relationship and, you know, we we do a lot more clinical work than we would be required to do from a regulatory perspective. E, why don't we get a question in from E? Do you have uh, yeah, great talk. I learned a lot. Um, one of my question is, uh, you showed a slide of this whole body uh, yeah. network modeling. Are you, is your heart flow model actually calculating the whole, whole body flow or just the heart? Just the, just the coronary arteries. Um, and, it, it, you know, that, that was work that was done at, um, that was my very last PhD student at Stanford uh, who did that work and actually ended up continuing his doctorate with uh, one of my former PhD students. Um, uh, but uh, in, in, in the field, there, there are different people working on different problems using this technology now for different clinical problems. But we're very much focused on the heart and the coronary arteries. Uh, we, we do recognize there's a lot of clinical benefit for other problems, you know, uh, you know for instance, uh, cerebrovascular disease, lower extremity vascular disease, aneurysms, um, but we just, um, you know, we're, we're really hyper-focused on trying to, um, you know, bring, be successful in, in, in uh, tackling a heart disease. And, and then we, we hope to be able to bring it into some of these other areas. Uh, my question is actually, when you have a cirrhotic liver or a yeah. lung, it changes yeah. the whole circulation system. Does it reflect anyway in the heart model that you are modeling? Yeah, you know, it could, if you, if you, uh, I would say, first of all, for the quantity of interest, which is a, this fractional floor reserve, it's the ratio of downstream to upstream pressure, and it's time averaged. So it's a mean flow quantity. It turns out that you can do a really good job of predicting that even making, by making some pretty, what you'd consider otherwise crude assumptions about cardiac output, blood pressure, et cetera. Um, and it's in part just because it's that quantity of interest. If we wanted to predict absolute flow, it would be a different, it might be a different question. You might have more interactions, but we don't see a lot of interactions with, you know, it's, it's fairly well contained. It's a benefit of the, 
of the invasive measurement that it's it's not as uh, it doesn't change with cardiac output, contractility, you know, et cetera, um, blood pressure. It's it's not much affected by that uh, by uh, reference aortic pressure. Um, so that's the that's the benefit of that, and and we've really been kind of focused on that metric. Um, but for it, indeed, we'll have to use a greater level of sophistication in the model as we go forward. And, and of course, I think as, as all of you know, it's you know the choice of model, the framework, or how you're going to solve a problem, are some of the most important you know uh, decisions that you have to make um, because you can easily overcomplicate things. I always. You know, I know uh, Einstein's, uh, the, the paraphrasing of Einstein's quote in the simplest possible model and no simpler. I, I certainly take that, um, you know, to heart, and no pun intended. Thanks very much. Yeah. Tom, do you want a final word? Sure. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Uh, so thanks for a very stimulating talk. You mentioned um, AI aiding in the analysis, which sounded yeah. like... Um, it's a relatively long and gradual process. Are there, um, can you say something about surprises or insights you've gained from that process? Yeah, well, we started using, I mean, before we started implementing deep learning methods, we we're using more traditional machine learning methods for about nine or 10 years. Um, and, um, you know, I would say the biggest, you know, I always thought we're gonna cross this threshold between machine and human performance. and. And it's a computer vision problem that we're solving, right? Trying to extract information about the coronary arteries from the medical image data, extract the geometry and the anatomy. Um, and I was skeptical, I have to say, early on, you know, that we would be able to cross the threshold. And now we still have a human in the loop, but there are specific parts of the problem that we don't have people change the algorithm because what we've demonstrated is that they make it worse that a human has no greater ability to interpret the image in an area of calcium than a machine does. Um, and, but it's until you prove that, until you, you know, prove that with a reasonable level of, of, uh, you know, of, of uh, data that you can get to that point. And I'm kind of surprised by how quickly that happened. You know, I mean, we've trained now, our latest uh, deep learning boundary detection algorithm is trained on data from, it's roughly you know, 15,000 patients. And with all the kind of cross-sectional images that are obtained, it's roughly 15 million you know, images. Um, so that's a lot of data. And, and I, I'm just surprised at how good it is. The other is that we recently developed a, a method. Once we had our inner boundary method developed, it took us just a, a, a couple of months to develop a new deep learning based uh, in, uh, software for doing the outer wall. So we could then quantify the amount of atherosclerosis in the vessel. And we will have gone from the initial research to the FDA submission within less than one year. And, uh, and it's fully automated. It takes about 15 seconds to compute the plaque in the entire coronary tree. And it, I'm blown away by the performance. You know, it's just stunning. And so I think, you know, there is something real there. And uh, I think there's incredible potential, you know, for these tools, but it's how do we start to get to the point you trust the model, right? And under what circumstances can you trust it, you know, um, without not just having a person look at it, but when can, when do they actually add value? Um, so that's something I'm really fascinated by. Uh, and we put a lot of effort into those answering those questions. Um, but it's, um, it's pretty exciting to be able to see that. And if I could inject a very quick uh, question, I'm not sure if the answer is quick, but have you thought about more complex geometries of flow, such as flow of the lymph? Not yet, no, <laughs> not at all, John. Yeah, not at all. Okay, well, we promised to let you go at four o'clock. And we thank you very much for taking the hour and talking with us. Great, thank very you. Very stimulating. And uh, we look forward to following the progress of this company and, and uh, all of the places you're branching out. We really appreciate it very much. Thank you again for thank coming. You. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Bye-bye. Right.